At the tail end of 2023, Ali Abdal released his first book called Feel Good Productivity. And let me tell you, I have been stalking this release for over a year now. Ali has actually been running a super successful YouTube channel all about productivity and has more than 5 million subscribers on YouTube alone. He's been branching out his business and not only has a YouTube channel, but also has a podcast called The Deep Dive and now a New York Times bestselling book. In his book, Feel Good Productivity, he argues that feeling good boosts our creativity and productivity, which is basically the opposite of the grind culture that has been really popular the last few years. What I love to do with books is create a book ecosystem. So if you take his book and look at what other books he mentions, like when he talks about people skills, he references radical candor. He also references designing your life when he talks about the Odyssey plan and some other non-reference but very similar concepts to books like the artist's way when he talks about play personalities and brain rules when he talks about the power of plants and green, you start to get an idea of this book ecosystem. You can also take this a step further by seeing what books these other authors reference and you start to build a web of these amazing books that build on top of one another and the lessons that start to really come alive. So if you recognize and love some of these other books, you'll probably like his book as well. He actually breaks down his book into three distinct parts, energize, how to build motivation and energy into your work, unblock, how to break through uncertainty and avoidance of goals, and finally sustain how to conserve and recharge your motivation. So in this video, we're gonna go over those three concepts and what makes these concepts come alive are actually the tips, like very actionable tips that he suggests using in your real life. So I'm gonna use a lot of examples from my life. So it's coming from a normal person rather than like a famous YouTuber who's a millionaire. According to a study done back in 2020, approaching life with a sense of adventure unlocks a lot of positive emotions. The study found that just taking yourself to a wider and more random assortment of places can increase your happiness, relaxation, and excitement about life. What was interesting is that this includes small behavior changes, like changing the route you take to work, try to mix it up, make it a little different, going to a new coffee shop, so trying a different coffee shop you've never been to before, and even going to local art museums or anything local that's just different to your standard routine. I will say this tip reminds me a lot of the artist date, which was coined by Julia Cameron in her book, The Artist's Way. So it's gonna have very similar twists where in The Artist's Way, she talks about, they're called artist dates, and you basically take yourself on a solo date each week, which is a lot harder than it sounds. But in Ollie's book, he takes it a step further by making what he calls eight play personalities, which you can try on to make work a little bit more fun. The first one is a collector. This is someone who loves to gather and organize. So they love to go to garage sales. They like collecting things like plants or baseball cards. The next is a competitor. This is somebody who enjoys games and sports. The next one is an explorer who likes to wander, likes to discover new places. Maybe they like hiking or road tripping. The next one is a creator who finds joy in making things, so creation. Next we have the storyteller who likes to entertain other people. Then the Joker, who loves to make people laugh. And the Director, who likes to plan, organize, and lead other people. And finally, the Athlete, who finds play in physical activities like running, gymnastics, and other physical forms. The question you want to keep asking yourself is, what would this look like if it were fun? Now, besides using play to energize your work, you can also use power. Granted, this introduces yet another study which questions whether confidence can have an impact on your athletic abilities. As it turns out, the high confidence group, the group that was told they have really high athletic abilities, enjoyed exercise more than the group that was told they were kind of unhealthy, so the low confidence group, that they were unhealthy and they had a far way to go. No, this makes sense, right? Obviously, if you're more confident, you're gonna perform well and enjoy things more, but this shows that it's actually how you feel about your abilities rather than your actual physical abilities. This is also known as self-efficacy, which is the belief that you can achieve greater things or your goals. So you wanna start asking yourself, what would it look like if I approached this task in a very confident way? What would that look like? Now, if you don't have a lot of natural confidence, you can actually take advantage of what's called the protege effect, which is where you teach somebody after you learn something. And you don't have to be an expert. You can just learn a little piece and then teach it. So you can either film a video or teach, teach a friend or something like that. 
personally what I do because I don't have just friends laying around willing to be taught by me is I actually create a document or a training manual. It's fake. I'm not actually training anyone, but it helps develop that protege effect because I write it as if I am teaching somebody. So let me show you. Okay, so this is like a guide that I would create. So I was learning SharePoint, right? And I wanted to teach something, take advantage of that protege effect, but I didn't have anyone to teach. So what I do is I actually use a software called Scribe. I'll link it below. It's like an amazing software for documentation, but I will essentially create a documentation and write it as if I'm teaching someone, right? Before creating a site, it's essential to define the site's objectives, you know, and just like other miscellaneous stuff or how to add a quiz on SharePoint. And I'll actually like film how to do it. Click this plus button. Again, Scribe just takes the screenshots for me. So it's super easy, but I'll do this and just create this massive file and then link stuff. Sometimes I'll also film videos on YouTube and kind of link it in there, but this is like my go-to guide. And then I'm reaping the benefits of the protege effect by writing this out. It's not necessary. And if I do actually need to train somebody, I already have it. So I do this every time I learn a new skill, whether it's SharePoint or Power BI or any Microsoft product or any actual technical skill, I will go ahead and write a document as if I'm teaching somebody. So we've broken down how we can use play and how we can use power or confidence to energize ourselves. There's actually a third component and that is people. We can use what's called relational energy, which is the idea that other people can have a huge effect on your mood and your ability to work. The best way to use this relational energy is to change your mindset when it comes to working with other people and think of them as comrades rather than as competitors. And then also ask for lots of help. Asking for help might seem like a weird way to get people to like you, but there's been so many studies on this that if you ask for help, people are like way more likely to think more highly of you. So it's a fantastic way to kind of gather that relational energy. The biggest thing that blocks people is actually uncertainty paralysis. And this is when there's a lot of unknowns behind a task and that causes you not to act on your goal. Now there are a few ways around uncertainty paralysis. And the first one is time blocking. And that is when you take chunks off your calendar and say, during this amount of time, I'm going to be working on this task. And you basically block it out. It's like time blocking. So you're going to set blocks around your calendar. The next method is to use the crystal ball method, which is what Ali coins in his book, but it's also known as the pre-mortem. And that's when you think about the things that are going to get in your way. So if you didn't do the task, like think ahead and say, I didn't do the task, write down the top three reasons why you wouldn't have actually done the task. This will give you an idea of what is going to be in your way when you actually go to work on it. Lastly, we have reducing friction, and this is essentially making it easy on yourself. What can you do to make doing that task slightly easier? For example, if I want to go to the gym, I will lay out my gym clothes the night before. It just slightly increases my chances of going to the gym. Or if I want to read more, I will put the book in my bag. I will put it on my desk. I will have it follow me wherever I go. Or if I'm trying to floss, I take the little flossers out of the bag and put them right next to my toothbrush. It's just those little tiny things that reduce friction enough to change your behavior. Now you might also come across fear as well as uncertainty, which is slightly different because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up, especially when you're pushing boundaries. And he talks about the 10, 10, 10 rule, which will help you feel a little bit less bad about it. In the 10, 10, 10 rule, there are three tens. The first one is, will this matter in 10 minutes? The next one is, will this matter in 10 weeks? And the third one is, will this matter in 10 years? And this is supposed to make you feel better because as you increase the time, you should start thinking, okay, this really isn't that big of a deal. When I first started hearing the word burnout, I used to think that this was just one type of burnout, right? You just like overextend yourself. You just burn out. I didn't realize there were different categories. And in his book, Ali Abdal actually lists out the three different categories. And I'm totally starting to realize that there are a couple that can sneak up on you. The first type of burnout is actually overexertion burnouts. This is literally working too hard. You're overcommitting, right? So this is just overcommitment at its core. The next one is depletion burnouts. This is when your mood is suffering and you need longer breaks. Taking a 30 minute break isn't going to solve this issue. 
And the last one is misalignment burnout. It's when you're doing the wrong stuff so you don't feel motivated to continue on because you're just misaligned. You're not necessarily burned out from exertion. Now, when it comes to overexertion and depletion burnouts, there's actually just a couple of tips and tricks we have, and then I'll talk about alignment burnouts, which are much harder to solve. The first tip is to schedule your breaks. Now I do this after very long meetings. If I have a hard meeting where I'm running it and I'm just like going after the meeting and overexerting myself, right? I will schedule like a 30 minute recovery time just in case anyone schedules something after the meeting. I don't want to do another big long meeting right after, especially if it's like an hour long. So that's something I do to schedule my breaks throughout the workday. The second tip is to have hobbies. I feel like a lot of people talk about this, but there's a reason for it, is you want something that's completely unrelated to work. So what I do, I personally use scrapbooking as my creative hobby that is low stress and not really much going on with it. And I basically just cut pictures and make a, a pretty picture of an event that I had socially. The third tip is to bring in nature. Now, this one is in a lot of recent self-help books talking about the power of nature plants, the color green. So there's lots of books talking about this. How I personally bring more green into my life is I buy plants. Now, I don't buy just any plants, I buy from easyplant.com, which is kind of embarrassing, but I have a hard time watering plants and you only have to water them once a month. So I'll link it below, but essentially you buy the plant, it comes in this like cardboard box, you unbox it, and then finally you have a perfect plant that you can water once a month and it won't die. I also change the screen color of my monitors, which I know a lot of people give me crap for at work. They're like bright green, but I'm like, I'm always staring at my monitor, so I just make it green. So I get like get some of those benefits of like relaxation and calmness by putting my background of my computer as green. And the fourth tip is something that I do constantly, and that is writing a day off. I just say, you know what, this day, usually a Sunday, I'm not gonna do anything productive. I'm not gonna read, I'm not gonna journal, I'm not gonna meal prep. I'm just gonna lay in my bed and watch Grey's Anatomy and eat ice cream. Like you just, sometimes you just gotta write off a day. And I saw him write that in the book and I was like, that is perfect, that is exactly what I do. Now for misalignment burnouts, it's a little bit more complicated because you have motivation on a spectrum. So let me show you. So you have a spectrum from less autonomous to more autonomous. And on the far left, on the less autonomous side, you have external motivation. And that's when you're saying, I'm doing this because important people will like and respect me more if I do, right? Less autonomous, not really about you, right? The next one is introjected motivation. And this is like, I'm doing this because I feel guilty if I don't. So a little bit more external, you know, kind of closer to the external motivation, less autonomous, but slightly more towards the middle. And then you have identified motivation. And this is, I'm doing this because I truly value the goal and it's helping me work towards it. That is more on the autonomous side, right? And then lastly, you have the gold standard, which is intrinsic motivation. I'm doing this because I love the process as an end of itself. I just love learning. That is very autonomous, the best one that you could do to increase happiness. Okay, so how do you get to more of that, uh, more autonomous side on the spectrum? Well, he suggests doing an Odyssey plan. Bill Burnett and Dave Evans actually coined the Odyssey plan in their New York Times bestseller books called Designing Your Life, and then they came out with Designing Your Work Life. And they're they're both fantastic reads um, and two guys who teach classes at Stanford University about how to build a life you love. The Odyssey plan is where you create three plans. One is your current path, like if you just stayed on the same path that you're on right now and just fast forward five years. And then there's an alternate path, which is a pivot, but it's a realistic pivot, um, an option that you have that you could basically pivot towards. It's, it's different than your current path, but you know, more realistic. And finally, you have the radical path, which is something that's considered very bold and risky when you tell your family about it. So I'll go over my Odyssey plan. So I start with my current path and I'm working in the semiconductor construction industry. So that would be continuing to work for large semiconductor companies like the one I work for now at Intel. And then my alternate path would be to transition maybe into software consulting, which I have dabbled in part time on the weekends, seen some success there. So that would be, you know, a realistic alternate path. 
And then lastly, I have my radical path, which would be taking YouTube full time and not actually working a traditional nine to five job. So uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel if you wanna support the radical path of mine. But those, that would be my Odyssey plan, just to give you an example. So this should help you think, hey, I do have options in my life and that should increase your autonomy overall. Now, one of my favorite concepts that Ali Abdal also talks about in his book is this idea of a wheel of life, which also gives me a sense of autonomy because it includes not only just work, but also your social life as well. You start with a circle and cut it into nine sections and then label the outside with nine different categories, which includes friends, romantic relationships, family, growth, money, career, soul, mind, and physical health. Then you rate yourself on this scale. Now he recommends rating it from a one to 10, but I just filled in the circle. So for example, I put the friends a little low because it's right after the holidays and we're kind of, they're starting to come back from vacation and starting to get my social life back together. But again, this is just a snapshot. Then romantic relationships, gave myself a healthy score there. Family as well, I live with my brother, so that's always naturally gonna be high. And then growth, I've been learning a ton of new technical skills, so I feel really good about that. Money, this is the first time I felt financially stable in a long time. And then we have work, which the score is low because I need to actually think about what I wanna do long term, but maybe I should have graded that a little higher because I am very satisfied at work and my manager's are great and all that. It's just, I need to sit down and think five years out. Then we have soul, which I do a lot of volunteer work and I consider soul as like community and all those you know soul-like things. So I gave myself a good score there mental mental health or you know brain or whatever that i gave myself pretty high because i've been working to reduce stress levels and lastly we have physical health which i go to the gym like three times a week and i'm constantly walking like i'm obsessed with getting 10,000 steps a day so good score there hopefully you can see that this book is very actionable and there's lots of activities to do even filming this i had to go through all the activities and it was super nice so i totally recommend you to actually go and do the activities it's very easy to watch somebody do it but just pause and you know work through it but if you're anything like me i'm also kind of obsessed with work and productivity like it's not just productivity i am obsessed with my job as well so i recommend a book called the good enough job and it will help you reclaim your life from work which which is something that, you know, Ali Abdal's book is kind of about, you know, increasing joy and fun, you know, having fun while you're working and that kind of stuff. So this is a good companion read. So I will link the video up here that I filmed and in the description below. Otherwise, I will see you guys next time.